They're getting the John Money story that has nothing to do with uh, modern trans ideology. Just in case they do suspect me. So that's Vosh. He is a particularly repugnant uh, TRA gender theist. This is Rubble of Empires. I'm Rubble. I'm doing a reaction video to Vosh's video. And it's a pretty exciting video to make because Vosh has gone and mentioned John Money. They're getting the John Money story that has nothing to do with uh, modern trans ideology. Sure, Jan. And for those who don't know, John Money is basically like the L. Ron Hubbard of gender identity. In that, when you sort of hear about the ideas of Scientology but don't know much about it, it's just this kind of, um, you know, useful tools for getting through your life. You're like, oh yeah, that seems like it could work. But then when you see L. Ron Hubbard <laughs> and you learn even a little bit about him you're like oh no this is obviously a giant scam and the same is true of john money and that is why gender theists work really really hard to try to distance themselves from him nothing to do with uh, modern trans ideology so in this video i want to show you that there's no running he is intimately linked and foundational to the u.s gender identity movement we're also going to talk about that fire where the nazis apparently burnt down all the trans research yeah essentially that's just john money but german with chimp balls and if you want to know what i mean by that you have to watch the rest of the video oh and finally i didn't actually get around to mentioning it in this video but vosh talks about the uh rorschach rainbow which is that scientific american diagram that's bullshit and meaningless that i made a rebuttal to a little while ago no real, no real point in mentioning that, but uh, yeah, we're kind of starting to, I feel like I'm building up some good attacks on core components of the gender movement. Oh, clap, 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 clap. Cool. I don't like John Money, by the way. We're not defending John Money. I'm just, yeah, that's cringe. Good thing. Let me find a quote from Adolf Hitler. The origins of the gender identity movement lie with a professor of medical psychology at Johns Hopkins in the 1960s. His name uh. was John Money. After twin boys were born. Ah, we're getting this one. We're getting this one, guys. We all know this one. I know you know of it, but do you really know this one? As we get further into this, it will become apparent that it really seems like you don't. They're getting the John Money story that has nothing to do with uh, modern trans ideology. Just in case they do suspect me oh. for botched circumcision destroyed one boy's penis that boy was raised as a girl by the time that boy was a teenager the boy felt extraordinary discomfort because he was biologically male and his parents told him the truth both twins ended up killing themselves in their mid-30s that didn't stop john money from founding the johns hopkins gender identity clinic in 1965 that's because the kid wasn't trans. So notice here, he's saying that's because the kid wasn't trans. So he has ignored the fact that Ben Shapiro just said. That didn't stop John Money from founding the Johns Hopkins Gender Identity Clinic in 1965. So Vosh just ignores that and goes into this kind of shitty analysis of what he thinks went wrong in the David Reimer case. But he never comes back to this. He skips over this whole founded the John Hopkins Gender Identity Clinic thing. And he never comes back to it. He never addresses it. He never goes, oh yeah, the John Hopkins Gender Identity Clinic. Yeah, that was founded by John Money, but it doesn't exist anymore. And as soon as everybody in the gender identity world found out how corrupt and perverse John Money was, they instantly distanced themselves from anything that he had anything to do with. But the thing is, is the John Money case was still unfolding in like the late 90s, early 2000s. It was on Oprah and shit. For years, this case was called a medical triumph, but in truth, the case was a failure, devastating the lives of just about everybody involved. This is David, who has remained anonymous until now. Vosh wants to pretend like the whole thing was sort of like over and done within the 50s, but the fallout from this case and the fact that John Money had lied to other medical professionals who then proceeded on the basis of those lies because John Money was the system's expert in gender identity. The For years, this case was called a medical triumph. The person who's commonly cited as having founded the term. 
In order to learn this information, all it takes is a quick click onto the Kinsey Institute website. Uh, Alfred Kinsey being another sexologist of dubious ethical foundations. In 1948, a book was published that sparked the sexual revolution. Unnoticed within it were the details of the sexual abuse of several hundred children. Who were these children? Who were their abusers? And how did the world's most famous sex scientist come to use the details of these sexual assaults as evidence of children's sexuality? <music> Professor Alfred Kinsey was the father of the sexual revolution who nonetheless enjoys wide esteem in the academic and, you know, mainstream world. So anyway, the Kinsey Institute has a section on its website about John Money. So John Money didn't die until 2006, and it says at the bottom of the site here that his professional correspondence continued up until 2004. So he was still alive and making his case, you know, as recently as 25 years ago. So later on, Vosch tries to make the comparison between Ben Shapiro and or gender critical thought, I guess, and the Nazis. He was parodying what he saw as the gender critical argument where he's kind of saying like, oh, you're just taking two people from random history that happen to think the same thing and then saying that the latter group is carrying on the work of the prior group. But there's a huge fucking difference between the gap between the Nazis and Ben Shapiro and the gap between US sexologists in 2004 and US sexologists in 2015. Part of what's funny about the whole like connection to the Nazis is uh, the idea that at one point there was this book burning in Nazi Germany and it targeted this researcher that they argue was doing research into trans uh, stuff. And it's like, first of all, there are heaps of photos of like cross-dressing and shit at like Auschwitz. The Nazis were way queer, but on top of which... It's just a weird assumption that because there was, like, research going on, that it must have been valuable, that it must have had some academic merit. And yet, at the same time, they totally acknowledge, like, oh, yeah, um, there was this researcher who was a key part of the U.S. medical industrial complex who accidentally, thinking he was doing a progressive thing, committed all these medical atrocities for decades and was aided and helped by the rest of the medical establishment and then i don't know i guess he just magically disappeared so why are we assuming that the experimentation done in germany i guess like maybe 30 years earlier when science was even cruder and more brutal so i just put a call out on twitter for anyone who had further information about this uh trans book burning and someone got back to me with this link, which is a Twitter thread from Malcolm Clark, or at Twister Film. Bio reads, Emmy-nominated TV producer, tweets a personal, made shows with Hawking, Dawkins, Jesse Jackson, and Gorbachev, so your silly quote-unquote queer theory doesn't scare me. Dope. So let's dive in. Where did the LGBTQ plus movement go wrong? How did a noble cause end up bullying artists and trying to destroy women's sports? The answer may lie buried in the movement's foundational myth about a sexology pioneer and his clinic. The truth is much darker than the myth. Dun dun. The myth says that the template for today's LGBTQ plus movement was laid down at Magnus Hirschfeld's Sexology Institute, founded in Berlin in 1919, where the happy marriage between gay and trans rights was forged. Here's even at Siam, or Scientific American, churning out this canard. An attached uh, Scientific American. I'm afraid of Scientific American. I can see that's not a girl. <laughs> I can see you can't help it. Three. 
Hirschfield, a gay man who is undoubtedly brave, but it's his claim that gay and trans people share some common affinity and his pioneering of quote-unquote sex change surgery that makes him an LGBTQ plus hero. A who's who of trans activism retweeted the Scientific American article. And here we have Joe Morm, or at Jollyon Morm, saying trans people have been around for a long time and their right to exist and to healthcare has always been contested. Four, but did they really read it? Here's the clinic in a starring role in the hit TV series Transparent. The trans woman with the red lipstick is Dora Richter, the first person to have a full quote-unquote sex change op, including the world's first ever vaginoplasty. Five, the Nazis closed the institute, burning its library, and Hirschfeld died in exile. While we don't, we don't know what happened to poor Dora, but her story has a dark side that suggests the clinic was never the exemplar that's now suggested. Take her experimental operation as an example. No, no, this was supposed to be not John Money all over again. This was supposed to be the paradise the Nazis burned. No experimental operation. Bad gender ideology. Six. It's a sign of how intellectually dishonest the LGBTQ plus movement has become that none of the Scientific American retweeters mentioned or noticed a detail that rather undermines the image of the Institute as fundamentally progressive. It was a reference to the surgeon Erwin Gorbrandt. The Nazis stole lists of clients, adding their names to pink lists from which to poach homosexuals for concentration camps. Levy Lenz, who, like Hirschfeld, was Jewish, fled Germany to escape execution, but in a dark twist, his colleague, Erwin Gorbrandt, with whom he had performed so many supportive operations, joined the Luftwaffe and would later contribute to grim experiments in the Dachau concentration camp. Hirschfeld's likeness would be reproduced on Nazi propaganda as the worst of offenders, both Jewish and homosexual, all that the Nazis would stamp out in their bid to produce the perfect heteronormative Aryan race. Six. Yes, on the upside, Erwin Gorbrandt experimented by inventing the vaginoplasty, creating Dora Richter and later Lily, the Danish girl, Elbs, quote-unquote, female sex organs. But on the downside, he'd go on to work for the Nazis, conducting a range of appalling experiments in Dachau. This doctor is not usually mentioned in histories of transsexual surgery. How many of these invented everything but we don't talk about him dudes does this fucking ideology have? Of course, the two sex change surgeries are only a small part of his curriculum vitae. <laughs> have you seen his human genderpede work? It's majestic. Erwin Gorbrandt studied medicine at the Military Medical Academy and graduated in 1917. He worked at the... I'm not even going to try to pronounce that in Berlin, uh, some, some university. He did the initial operations on the first two transsexuals to have modern surgery. In 1922, he arranged for Gorbrandt to do the castration on uh, Dork and Richter. And oh yeah, so those are the two examples he mentioned. From 1940, he worked at the Urban Hospital and was also the medical chief and later a general for the Luftwaffe. 
Uh, he also participated in lethal hypothermia experiments at Dachau concentration camp and in October 1942 presented a paper to the hypothermia conference held at the Deutsche Hof Hotel in Nuremberg. In February 1945, he was awarded the Ritter uh, <laughs> the Knight's Cross of the War Merit Cross with swords on Hitler's personal authority. Oh no! Shit. I knew we shouldn't have looked. Just point at the rainbow, gesture at the scientific American article. Don't, don't look into things. Oh, he escaped prosecution after the war, retired in 1958, and died a wealthy and respected citizen. Eight. Gorchbrandt went straight from experimentally castrating sex change patients to sterilizing the mentally disabled at Am Urban Hospital in Berlin. Sterilizing the mentally disabled. Wasn't it the case that there's like a huge comorbidity between autism and trans identities? I seem to remember that. <clears throat> anyway. Here's a paper he co-authored in 1937, which provides some information on the history and technique of sterilization. Nine, as the Luftwaffe's top medic, he wanted to find out how pilots who bailed might survive in the sea. 300 prisoners were repeatedly immersed in freezing water for hours until they died. Colleague Sigmund Rascher created saddlebags from hu human skin. <laughs> Organic trans saddlebags. Get your organic trans saddlebags. Vegan organic trans saddlebags. You obviously want the Nazis to win if you don't buy your organic human skin saddlebags. 10. On its own, the fact that the doctor who helped invent the vaginoplasty for Hirschfeld became a monster is troubling. But unfortunately, that's only one of many problems with the mythic story of the Institute. Take this blatant racism. Uh, so this is a quote from uh, Reisenstein. North American native women are not better, indeed in some cases, even more repulsive than South American women. How hideous the aspect of old Haida women, for example. <laughs> what a doctor. <laughs> He doctors like a pro. 11. The clinic's ethnology department. <laughs> it's literally got like human heads in jars and stuff in it. <laughs> Was run by Baron Ferdinand von Reisenstein. Uh-oh. Who argued African women were too sexually dominant and advocated benevolent German colonial intervention to solve that. So much for that BLM virtue signaling from Tachel, Morm, et al. I guess that would include Vosch and Riley Grace Richong at this point too. Reisenstein postulated a theory that human development from natural to civilized people is accompanied by a growing differentiation of the gender order. While civilized nations, as he argued, are marked by clear-cut separation between male gainful employment and female domestic work, natural peoples, at the other end of the scale, could be described by their levelling social orders where both genders work on comparable positions. A similar scheme could be observed, as he added, in the case of sexuality, where in civilized societies, women live their sexual lives as a passive devotion to male active sexuality within natural societies. In contrast, the sexual conduct of both genders could be described as active, lustful, or rude. <coughs> Doctored the shit out of that. <laughs> The problematized sexuality of African women was, in this perspective, not a result of bodily pathologies, but rather the end result of social structures that made women, quote, almost like men. Ooh, wow. And, and gender theists today still say black women and men are the same thing. Uh, the sexualization of African women and their defeminization went, in this account, hand in hand. Interestingly, such an interpretation of the binary gender order as the front line of human history called not only for a colonial intervention into seemingly differing colonized societies, von Reisenstein himself advocated a so-called benevolent colonialism in which Europeans should, quote, teach Africans their more, quote, developed gender order. 
but also constituted the rejection of any equality measures in a European context. Voss Reisenstein stated that a branch of our women's movement which wants to carry out gainful employment in male clothing has to be evaluated in terms of sexual pathology. <laughs> yeah, that's my South African German. The rosy myth about the clinic suggests Hirschfeld himself challenged such regressive gender binary attitudes. That's a complete misunderstanding. In the 18th and 19th centuries, the view prevailing in the medical professions and among anthropologists was that men and women differed fundamentally both physically and mentally. There is an extensive body of literature on sex and gender differences, as well as on the body structure and psyche of women, naturally written by men. Some institute staff members concern themselves with the anthropology of women, e.g. Hans Freidenthal worked on gender-specific hair growth and Baron von Blah Blah who researched breast shapes in women. With 19th century descriptions of the sexes as point of departure, Hirschfeld develops a pluralist sexual theory for the 20th century, the theory of sexual transitions. It assumed all physical and mental human characteristics expressed themselves in male and female forms. Genitals, body size, bone structure, skull, pelvis, joints, muscular system, strength, hands, larynx, hair growth, breathing and perspiration, gait and form of greeting, mimicry, handwriting, etc. The absolute man, an individual with exclusively male characteristics, and the absolute woman with exclusively female characteristics constituted opposing extreme ideal types. According to this theory, all people were mixed forms of more diverse combinations of male and female features. Hirschfeld calculated the number of possible sexual types, at least 43 million. Ah, <laughs> oh, you're fucking around with your 69 genders. <laughs> you haven't even got into the triple digits of uh, gender identity yet. Uh, you barely scratched the surface. You thought hexadecaroons <laughs> was an obsessive amount of detail of a social identity. 13. While he claimed there were over 43,000, I thought it said million, anyway, different sexual types, those were all defined as different combinations of specific male and female biological traits. So a man might have a feminine pelvis or a woman a masculine larynx or skull. <laughs> it was nonsense and it got worse. Homosexuality, he said, was caused by a biological defect, so gay men were effectively demi-women and could never be 100% male. Wow. Based in homophobia. So weird. They were effeminate, with weak muscles, mincing gait, or feminine handwriting. No wonder many gay men argued strongly against Hirschfeld's work. In 1895, Oscar Wilde was condemned to two years hard labour for homosexual acts. Hirschfeld repeatedly quoted the case as a scandalous example of the prevailing sexual criminal law and mentioned it as a major compelling reason for concerning himself with homosexuality. For almost 40 years, Hirschfeld courageously campaigned for the decriminalization and social recognition of homosexuals. For him, there was a cognate argument against prosecuting homosexuals. Same-sex behavior could not be put down to any depraved lifestyle nor to seduction, but rather it resulted from a sexual constitution incurred through no fault of one's own and very often not of one's own liking. Hirschfeld spent his whole life scientifically substantiating his line of argument, taking up the concept of a third sex postulated by Karl Heinrich Ulrichs, 1825 to 1895, i.e. an innate combination of sexual characteristics, Hirschfeld outlined the male homosexual as an effeminate special type as regards, quote, body and soul. Ah, I love learning. <clears throat> he and his colleagues traced as elements a smooth, fine skin, soft hair, wide pelvis, 
a feminine handwriting, a weak muscular system, a mincing gait, etc. Hirschfeld's image of the homosexual did not fail to provoke contradiction. In the early phases of the German homosexual movement, it was not only a figure of identification, but also a forbidding and repellent image. Homosexual men and organizations fiercely attacked Hirschfeld's, quote, demi-women. The theory of homosexuality's innate character was widely and strongly criticized scientifically, presumably because Hirschfeld employed this argument to back up his battle to have homosexuals recognized. 15. Hirschfeld saw homosexuality in terms that could have come straight out of today's trans activism. As this article reveals, he studied lesbian vaginal secretions to try to find sperm and gay men's urine to try to find menstrual blood. Lesbian penis, anyone? 16. It's one of the greatest ironies of all about the status of Hirschfeld and his dodgy clinic in today's LGBTQ plus movement that no one mentions his promotion of a vicious form of gay conversion. It all started with a remarkable, quote, discovery of Dr. Eugene Steinach. Oh, dude, he literally has jars. He literally has jars. Uh, uh, <laughs> oh my god, they're not human heads, but... <laughs> Fuck, man, that's brilliant. Uh, 17. In 1919, when the clinic was founded, Europe was in the middle of a craze for monkey gland transplants. <laughs> uh, chimp me up, duck. The famous cocktail is named after Sergei Vornoff's bizarre op in which rejuvenating slices of baboon balls were inserted into a patient's scrotum. Maybe that's where AIDS came from. <laughs> uh, 18. Not to be outdone, the respectable endocrinologist Steinach announced he'd discovered male cells in the ovaries of a homosexual goat. Oh, okay. Yep. All right. Female homos- a lesbian goat. In a leap of imagination, he now suggested male homosexuals might be cured if they were castrated and given testicles from straight men. Oh, 19. The organs were obtained from straight men who had undescended third testicles. Magnus Hirschfeld became one of Steinach's most stalwart champions and sent gay men to be cured. The numbers were likely small, but the implications were huge. 20. It is often claimed that Hirschfeld's argument that homosexuality was a medical defect was just a useful tactic in his campaign to get decriminalization. But had this crazy, quote, gay cure he promoted taken off, thousands might have been maimed. Of course, it didn't work. The best criticism of Hirschfeld I've seen is this essay by Chandak Sengupta and came from a contemporary Dr. Edwin Babb, who argued tomboy girls were, quote, simply uncommonly wild and not biologically masculinized, as Hirschfeld insisted. Amen to that. Feminism was not universally shared by other members of the group, but they were unanimous in their valorization of a true homosexual masculinity. Nor did they find Hirschfeld's biological vision of gender at all plausible. The physician Edwin Babb, for example, asserted that a tomboyish girl who liked climbing trees was, quote, simply uncommonly wild, end quote, and not, as Hirschfeld would claim, biologically masculinized. Merely rearing and habit, stated Babb, caused boys to prefer soldiers and girls' dolls, cooking stoves, and such playthings. Despite their important differences in focus and nuance, these critics of Hirschfeld were arguing for a sweeping re-evaluation of the concepts of masculinity and femininity, not simply for the emancipation of homosexuals. Whatever one might think of the social or moral worth of that project, it was historically less likely to impress contemporary society and the state than Hirschfeld's moderate proposal for reform and reconceptualization. Unlike Hirschfeld's views, which were discussed widely in medical texts and attained some prominence, however temporary, in the socio-political arena, the writings of his opponents remained on the fringe, ignored, or persecuted. 
at first and then essentially forgotten until the recent boom in, in scholarly studies on the history of homosexuality. To paraphrase Hekma, one might say that these activists wished to gain masculinity for the homosexual at the expense of respectability. 22. The Hirschfield Clinic is indeed a perfect pinup for today's confused LGBTQ plus movement. For one thing, Hirschfield promoted highly experimental and dangerous surgery on both trans people and gay men. His evidence base was even less than that for puberty blockers. 23. Just like the LGBTQ plus movement, his project was rooted in rigid gender stereotypes and like it, his clinic was obsessed with claims that the obvious sex of someone could disguise a different, hidden sex identity. And just like them, his approach was steeped in internalized homophobia. His lumping together of gay, trans, and intersex people as if they share common needs worked profoundly against gay people's interests, as it does right now in the gender identity clinics, where doctors follow Hirschfield's lead in trying to cure young gays with hormones or surgery. Above all, it tells you everything you need to know about how unanchored the LGBTQ plus movement has become that it's willing to ignore the clinic's rampant racism, Nazi doctors, and quote, gay cures to hold some dream of gay and trans harmony. It's time we ditched this toxic myth. As we know, the country with the highest rate of sex reassignment surgery is Iran, and they don't do it because it's progressive, they do it because it's homophobic. And that's just one way they kind of spuriously try to argue that there was some real intense transphobia in Nazi Germany that was like distinct and separate from the homophobia that was there, that they really had this like passionate hatred of a, of a postmodern academic concept that hadn't been invented yet. It wasn't the gender nonconformity and same-sex relationships that repulsed them. It was the metaphysical disagreement. Like, you may as well say, like, the Nazis hated the Crips. Like, yeah, probably, if they were to be around at the same time period. But I really don't think a war with a gang that hadn't been invented yet was at the forefront of their mind. And had the Nazis happened to burn a bunch of records that, like, Snoop was gonna use or something, like, that's still not a war with the Crips. So anyway, point is, the Nazis didn't invent the term peak trans. The Nazis didn't invent the term sex-based rights. Apart from, like, this potentially perceived overlap in the most strained Venn diagram you've ever seen. And that's enough to dismiss all gender-critical thought. Whereas John Money, right here, in 1966... Dr. Money founded the Gender Identity Clinic at Johns Hopkins University and started an extensive research program on the psychohormonal treatment of paraphilias and on sex reassignment. Money formulated, defined, and coined the term gender role and later expanded it to gender identity slash role. In 1961, he proposed the hypothesis that androgen is the libido hormone for both sexes. Okay, so there you go. He's not just like some tangentially related guy who happened to support the concept of gender identity. He is the dude who fucking invented it. And think, unless you think like the Kinsey Institute is in on this or something. They're too turfy for you now, you know? The SS weren't chanting, the future is female. Hitler's great, this pussy grabs back speech. That, yeah, that, that, the kid wasn't trans. This is a boy. What you're describing validates my argument. That boy had gender dysphoria. But, <clears throat> so the first time I saw this, I thought Vosh had misspoken and that he meant to say that boy didn't have gender dysphoria and that's why these treatments were unnecessary and they harmed him and that's what killed him. He was like, and so, um,
which shows how little he understands about what happened in these experiments. They're fucking horrific. I have a thing explaining it, but it's like too cartoony to capture the horror um, of it. There's a documentary people should see called um, The Boy Who They Turned Into a Girl. If you look for my series, Money and the Cost of Gender, in the description, it has the proper title. It's like a BBC documentary. He thinks, like, David Reimer was misgendered to death, which shows how little he understands about what happened in these experiments. They're fucking horrific. The kids were basically abused. Like, the dude openly advocated for pedophilia. He, and then was he was given, what was his jobs? Like, uh, paraphilias and intersex babies. So they gave that job to a pedophile. And he had control over these this whole family. He essentially groomed with gender identity ideology. And he the way he was able to do it was because he had already groomed a bunch of intersex families into letting him experiment without any medical basis on those children and perform unnecessary operations. You know, doesn't that sound familiar? To look at the treatment that this kid received, regardless of whether it was gender affirming or not, it was obviously abusive and obviously was going, and was like constituted sexual abuse and was obviously going to fuck this kid up for life. And the proof of the fact is that his brother killed himself as well. And his brother wasn't misgendered to death. So Vosh is seriously here going, yeah, John Money proves my case. John Money like misgendered a kid to death and that proves you can misgender people to death and that's why gender affirming care helps. That's the argument he's making. Why do conservatives bring this up? Wow, misgendering and being treated in a way incongruent with your identity led to a person's suicide? I wonder if we can we can arrive at any conclusions from this. Why, they, this is unironic. This is being cited as an anti-trans position. His theory was children could identify as members of the opposite sex and that radical surgery was the proper solution. We don't... Just to be perfectly clear, guys, in case you were wondering, like, modern trans ideology to the extent that it exists... There's no mafia. ...is not based off John Money. Really? It says so here on the Kinsey Institute website that he coined the term gender role and gender identity. And he was academically active up until 2000. He's giving away scholarships. He, people were getting John Money scholarships as recently as 2015. He has not been resigned to the dustbin of history. And even if he was, he's still the dude that intellectually pioneered the concepts on which modern gender identity is based. And there's nothing they can do to get around that. Okay. What conservatives do is they reel out to this guy because this guy did a lot of really shitty things. But he didn't just do shitty things. These, these shitty things were specifically related to gender identity. It wasn't like, you know, a football player who, like, you know, you can't doubt their talent, but they're shitty off the field and, they, and they're getting into fights at nightclubs and stuff like that. It's like one doesn't really have anything to do with the other. But in the case of John Money, it was this amazing confluence of not just him like he's not like a cartoon character that bent history he is a product of his time and his experiments are also a product of him and the assumptions that he made are so much a product of the system that he kind of made them within the lesson Vosh wants people to take away is like oh yeah John Money was some scientist guy who liked gender but did bad things and so he sucks and we don't like him anymore and nobody cites him. That's Vosh's understanding of John Money. He doesn't, uh, he, I would assume what's partially responsible for this is that John Money would be considered true scum, obviously true scum. If Buck Angel is considered true scum, then uh, John Money is definitely true scum. Contrapoint is now dealing with alcoholic depressive bouts because of the drama she's received. In this instance, for including a trans medicalist 
in a 12 second segment. So if they're going to be driving other people to suicide over 12 seconds of exposure to Buck Angel, I can't imagine they're spending a lot of time reading up or researching about John Money. But then the funny thing is, this is all from an old video called uh, Queer Theory Confessions, which is about ContraPoints getting in trouble for uh, including a 12 second Buck Angel clip in a video. And so Vosh is kind of in this video coming to ContraPoints' defense, and in doing so, he says this. 15 years ago, you could be a trans medicalist and be like the fucking cool trans activist, the big woke progressive type person, you know? So that's basically the whole argument right there. That's Vosh saying that there is a direct link between trans medicalism and modern day too cute queer theory that occurred over the space of 15 years in his assessment. So weird how he can instantly recognize it in this context. But then when it comes to looking at the history of the medicalized concept of gender identity, bloop, that obvious connection just disappears. Natalie often re refers to herself as one of the last old school transsexuals. And while I do feel like that's kind of a LARPy term, um, <clears throat> it's, probably indicative at least of a slightly different mindset. Queer theory elevates only one identity as authentic, the queer identity, which ceases to be queer the moment it is accepted or even able to be categorized. But no, that he'd be considered like, you know, a dangerous text in Scientology, like you would get in trouble for looking at it, essentially. <clears throat> And so if his understanding of John Money is no one ever cites him, there's no reason to ever look at his work or understand what he did and how and why he did it. For years, this case was called a medical triumph, but in truth, the case was a failure. Then that's how you know Vosh doesn't know if there's a connection between John Money and the modern trans movement. All he knows is that it's they're in trouble if there is that's what he senses he knows that'll be the downfall if that's a connection that you know lots of people start to make but he understands that not on a logical like not because he understands the arguments he kind of senses it on a social level and they're like ah so this is the origin of the gender movement it's not so much this is the origin of the gender movement as this is a really key pivotal moment in the history of the gender identity movement. And what it demonstrates is that the gender identity movement can be based on, has had a history of being based on fucking nothing. And yet they have still been able to acquire widespread acceptance and mainstream support to the point that they are able to carry out for-profit medical experimentation on marginalized sections of the community. Recently in the US, among the institutions that are currently promoting this stuff. It would be like, <laughs> like, well, you know what? I can do this too. Hey, Ben Shapiro. You're part of the anti-gender theory movement, right? No, what are you talking about? It's not an anti-gender theory movement. This is exactly the thing that religious fundamentalists say to atheists, where they try to make atheism some positive belief system. Like, the reason why Ben Shapiro and I have any kind of shared, any kind of shared politics around this stuff is not because there's any broader ideological agreement except this one issue. It's like the whole emperor has no clothes thing. If this delusional guy is walking around, people with all sorts of different political persuasions are going to be like, yeah, that's a naked guy right there. And the people who are going like, oh no, look at his lovely suit. It's because they're beholden to an ideology that they're saying that. It's not because there's some ideological agreement among the people who are essentially doing little more than recognizing material reality. Do you know what the largest book burning in history of trans medical documentation was? Yeah, we actually just did a deep dive on it. You should have been here. It was pretty good. It was done by the Nazis. But wait, aren't trans medicalists basically Nazis anyway? Isn't that why Contra got in trouble? Your ideological origins can be found in the Third Reich, Ben Shapiro. If you want to look at the beginning of the anti-trans movement, you need look no further than 1930s Germany. Now, modern ideologues like Ben Shapiro carry forth the will of Adolf Hitler as they, like... 
I could do that if I wanted to. Today's uh, episode is definitely about reaching, though. You know, about, um, you know, battle rappers that reach, you know, and they, with their bars, their schemes or whatever. I, I am equally wrong in this argument as Ben Shapiro is in his current argument here. It was the first time a reach was really displayed to the world. Some people didn't know how to deal with the reach. Some people panicked when they seen it was a reach. No, I actually think that what I'm saying right now is truer than what he's saying. Some people love the reach. Yeah. You know, the reach had actually uh, a lot going on with it. Um, the reach has a lot of people nervous nowadays. The inside, these kids were members of the opposite sex in reality, and that surgery would merely make their bodies align with their identity. Money claims that, quote, the gen Oh, by the way, it should be um, it should be pointed out that for people who actually do have gender dysphoria, yes, that was correct. But doesn't this contradict the whole message that there's no connection between John Money and the modern gender identity movement? Instead, Vosch is saying, actually, John Money came to this really pivotal insight. It was hampered in a few slight ways, but his general assessment that individual people can be possessed with a gender identity is correct. And that might seem like a minor thing to people who think gender identities are normal, but gender identities are only ever necessary when someone's trying to disassociate from their physical body. So the example I used in an earlier video was like a hand identity. So you can feel like a two-handed person, but that doesn't actually change how many hands you have. <laughs> and there's a difference between, you know, you can say, oh, well, that person's cis-handed because they identify with the number of hands they have. It's like, I don't identify with the number of hands I have. I recognize the number of hands I have. There's a difference. You only need an identity when you're trying to relabel what's there. Yes, that true. Plenty of research has found that mental illness and suicide goes down significantly after gender-affirming care. Gender-affirming care. Gender-affirming care. Gender affirmation. Doesn't that... It's religious on its face. But the more relevant point to this discussion is that whether or not desexing transgender people helps them is actually irrelevant to the fact as to whether or not John Money pioneered the idea that desexing certain parts of the population for aesthetic purposes, first beginning with intersex people, and then as tragedy and circumstance allowed, expanding out into greater and greater markets, like a oh, capitalist enterprise. Uh oh. So. Okay. Yeah. Or was that Joseph Gordon-Levitt doppelganger that I saw at the Starbucks on 9th Avenue not styling? Cool. I don't like John Money, by the way. We're not defending John Money. I'm just... Just in case they do suspect me. It's the, the premise that, uh, that uh, transitioning helps trans people is an extremely well-accepted one. Again, also, not really the point. Like, the question isn't have some of these ideas become widely accepted by the medical establishment. Everybody agrees that that has happened. <laughs> the question is, do these ideas have their roots and their like intellectual foundations in the concepts that were developed by John Money? And the answer is obviously yes, because even today we have Vosh here using John Money's terminology. Because he says, oh, this is a bit cringe at one point to this gender identity gate opening at birth and then closing at one or whatever. And that's like ridiculous. Yeah, that's cringe. Good thing. Let me find a quote from Adolf Hitler. But what's ridiculous about that to gender theists isn't the gate, <laughs> isn't the gender identity, isn't all these concepts that are all, that all come out of John Money's work. What's ridiculous to them is that it closes and that a, ge and that a gender identity is ever fixed, at least to the extent that no transition is ever doubted. Like you could be 99 and on your deathbed and one of the core tenets of, you know, the fundamentalism 
of gender theism is that that transition is every bit as meaningful as someone who started to be slowly murdered by the medical industrial complex before they were even a teenager because their parents had Munchausen by proxy and were homophobic. Gender identity. Okay, let's see. The gender identity gate is open at birth for a normal child, no less than for one born with unfinished sexual organs and would stay that way at least a year. Yeah, that's cringe. Good thing. Let me find a quote from Adolf Hitler. Now, now for a quote from, uh, from the person who, was in, who inspired Ben Shapiro. Words build bridges into unexplored regions. If you tell a big enough lie and tell it frequently enough, it'll be believed. It is not truth that matters, but victory. Hmm. That's a little bit on the nose, considering what Ben Shapiro was doing at the moment. Lying. Ah, oh, the quote said lying, and then you said lying. Ah, oh, what a sick burn. Lying. That's exactly the same as John Money inventing the concept of gender identity. Lying non-stop because he's paid by billionaires? Are those cigarette burns signaling time for a changeover? Lying non-stop because he's paid by billionaires? Because that seems like some intense projection. In terms of getting paid by billionaires, uh, the 11th hour by which is Jennifer Bilek's uh, blog. It essentially documents how the medical industrial complex uses the NGO industrial complex to manufacture consent for its modern day eugenics program and mass sterilization for its continued colonization of human bodies and society. You know, you tell a lie long enough, people start to believe it. Gate is open at birth for a normal child, no less than for one born with unfinished. That's not Hitler, that's like Goebbels. I just googled Hitler quote. I don't have Hitler quotes on hand. Turns out, apparently, I can't even google Hitler quotes. So, for someone who reaches for Hitler quotes so readily, it's weird that I can't actually get them in me. Sex organs and would stay that way for at least a year. So, in other words, you could have a full biological boy with finished sex organs, and his gender identity was still open. Brains and bodies were considered- It's a- damn, it's a- Hey, Ben Shapiro fans, if Ben Shapiro is so confident in his debunking of trans ideology, which we're more than halfway through the video and we haven't gotten it yet, why is he citing quotes from a person nobody cites or uses research for anymore? So is Vosh saying the Kinsey Institute is nobody? They're an irrelevant part of the U.S. sexological sphere. <laughs> the other thing that is revealing about this is that he doesn't disprove that John Money laid the foundations of the modern gender identity movement. That's not what he's claiming here. He's saying nobody cites him anymore. But whether or not people currently cite him is a completely different question to whether or not he laid the intellectual foundation for the modern gender identity movement in like a direct way, such as coining core parts of the phrase ology and constantly lying to allow this like bullshit made up science to filter its way into the medical system. For years, this case was called a medical triumph, but in truth, the case was a failure. This is the weird relationship between true scum, trans medicalists and gender and self-ID fundamentalists have, where the self-ID fundamentalists need the trans medicalists to give uh, some kind of scientific um, veneer to their postmodern neoliberal babble. Thank God for transmedicalism, right? Oh, except not because you just destroyed transmedicalism with facts and logic, so we have no theory. What am I supposed to tell the TERFs? That I'm a woman because reasons? No, not even because reasons, just because you are. So it's what, a leap of faith? Delusion is what separates us from the animals. But because their babble is babble and it's just pure abstraction. Not even because reasons, just because you are. Anytime it is like actually applied to the material world, it kind of causes atrocities. And because this type of medical colonization works similarly to other forms of, I guess, uh, oppression, um, but specifically like racism and sexism, where 
they'll, you know, poll white people. And it doesn't matter what decade it was, white people will say, oh, yeah, 30 years ago, racism was fucked up, but uh, now it's all good. And a similar thing happens with medicalized gender identities, where it's like, oh, yeah, obviously in the past, it was this insane, like, Frankenstein um, run by the free market, and this dude that huh, was a pedophile, what a surprise. But now today, now that it's got all the acceptance and all the money in the world, of course the industry's cleaned up its act. We're no longer stapling pigeons to rats. I made a pigeon rat. The way you're questioning how I like to desex human beings really makes me think you might be a Nazi. <laughs> that so-called human genderpede you may have heard about happened a very long time ago and nobody even cites it, so I don't know why you're talking about it. I mean, the way you're questioning my freakish medical oppression of marginalized sections of the population that really sterilize, you know, the way I like to sterilize him, the way you question the way I like to sterilize makes me think you're a Nazi. I'm just gonna say it, I'm gonna say it. I like to sterilize, you like to Nazi, that's just the way it is. Why is he citing quotes from a person nobody cites or uses research for anymore? Like, just out of curiosity, right? Like, it, like, imagine if somebody was going out there to debunk the round earth, and they started citing, like, 11th century scientists and physicists, you know? Like, I mean, <laughs> to, be, to be honest, I don't even really uh, understand the analogy he's making, but I do understand that he's talking about periods of hundreds of years and... Uh, completely different geographic locations. Like, John Money was still publishing... John Money was still publishing work after 9-11. John Money was still alive. I don't know if he was still publishing, but he was still alive after the Iraq War, like, officially ended. Ah, yes. Uten, Newton Kaliwak, uh from England, uh, 1136. 1136. Accents. Dude, this is... 2004, Harvard University graduate, John Hopkins. Like, this isn't fucking hieroglyphics. Like, the Dead Sea Scrolls or some shit. The dude who was just in the building and in charge? Yeah, I have this theory. He was just in the building and in charge. Deduced that the world must be a sphere uh, because of the orientation of the salmon as it climbs up the waterfall to uh, meet with its uh, mating uh, partners uh, upriver. Um, obviously, <clears throat> well, mm, if you take a look at the research, this does not prove the existence of a spherical Earth. These calculations are absurd, frankly. And that's why the Earth is flat. Like, oh, clap, 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 clap. You know, maybe use more modern research. Maybe any of the dozens of studies that affirm the idea that gender therapy is helpful to trans people or... This is so weird for so many reasons. First of all, John Money's work did suggest that gender transition was helpful to trans people. Or at least that was definitely the intention of John Money. So when Vosch says that he wants to focus on those articles, it's like, yeah, we are. And we're talking about how there was this whole body of work, two whole bodies of work now, that promoted the idea of sex reassignment surgeries, essentially desexing people because you can't resex someone. You get sexed six weeks after conception, and that's it. And you can desex like a lot of mammals, but you can never resex someone. And somehow, despite the fact that it was based on complete medical fabrication, these atrocities were able to embed themselves into the medical establishment. Even the purported opponents of John Money accept his narrative and his definitions and his frameworks as obvious objective truths. When the whole lesson of Money was that it was a Frankenstein pseudoscience. It's like a version, it's like a really intense version of cold reading dead relatives. Look, what I do doesn't hurt anybody. I give people closure and help them cope with life. No, you give them false hope and a belief in something that isn't real but I'm a psychic. 
No, dude, you're a douche. I'm not a douche. What if I really believe dead people talk to me? Then you're a stupid douche. I think I've had enough of your bullying me. Get out of my house or I'll run upstairs lock myself in my panic room and call the police. Except their cold reading, your gender identity, and it's super important because you're making these really big ritual sacrifices where they cut, get around and like cut your genitals. But yeah, it's just a religious scam. ...in direct opposition, completely separate from one another. Radical feminists like Judith Butler. <laughs> Judith Butler is kind of famously not a radical feminist. She is radical, uh, but she is much more postmodern than a radical feminist. And that's one of the big weaknesses of having this information presented to you by someone like Ben Shapiro. Radical feminists like Judith Butler. Hey! Began arguing that all gender was socially constructed. Another person who wrote in the 1960s. Again, this is hilarious because one of Judith Butler's most defining works, Gender Trouble, Feminism, and the Subversion of Identity, came out in 1990. So once again, Vosch has no conception of when things actually occurred, but a staunch insistence that if they didn't happen in the last, like, 15 minutes, they're no longer relevant. Just crazy, man. Just all these 50 to 60-year-old theorists. Also, Judith Butler wasn't a biologist. Ah, uh, yeah, that's weird. No one said she was. He's acting like key academics like this don't often work for their entire lives. Like, how fucking old is Chomsky? When was his, you know, first important works published? Like, how old is Manufacturing Consent? 1988. Even older. But we can still see how Noam Chomsky could be influencing modern leftism, for example. Or at least still be academically relevant. And that therefore all inequalities in outcome between men and women could be laid at the feet of an evil, sexist society. Yeah. Okay. If gender is a meaningless social construct created by society, why does it matter more than sex? Which is actually- People don't say- People don't say gender is meaningless. They say it's arbitrary. Shut up. <laughs> that has nothing to do with anything. It's just a way for you to- do this little red herring where you get to pretend like you invented the concept of social construction. The question isn't about whether it's meaningless or arbitrary. What Ben Shapiro said was people are saying gender is more important than sex. That even if you have a clearly male body, your gender identity supersedes that objective fact. And that's true, because obviously gender identities are based on disassociation. So they need to value things that foster disassociation over acknowledging material reality. So yeah, ultimately we're left with a situation where Vosch doesn't even really attempt to demonstrate how John Money's thinking is different from the modern gender identity ideology, which may or may not exist. This thing of ours, La Cosa Wokestra. Ah! <laughs> He just kind of calls you stupid for assuming that that would be the case. Are you in the mob? There's no such thing as modern gender ideology. It's a stereotype, and it's offensive. And you're the last person I would want to perpetuate it. Fafangul. Fafangul? Is that it? <laughs> um, anyway, I wanted to say hi to all the new subscribers, and hi to all the longtime supporters. I've been getting a decent flow of new subscribers recently, so that's been great. It really helps when people like the video. I don't put up like the video stuff as much as I should, but that helps obviously comment, subscribe, all that good stuff. Yeah, also if you can get onto Twitter, at uh, Flying Gender is my handle, and if you can retweet stuff, that helps a lot. And you know, obviously having it on different platforms. If you're on somewhere, like if you're a Redditor or something like that, and you can get it into some as yet unbanned gender critical part of Reddit or whatever, I'm, I'm being delirious. Clearly I need to lie down. But if someone could help, <laughs> that would be great. Uh, yeah, I really love that this was um, the video that was at the thousand subscriber mark. I didn't even end up touching on the whole uh, Rorschach rainbow and the fact that he brought out the Riley Grace Rochong Rorschach rainbow and started talking about it like it was real. That, that was like, you know, a gift from heaven. 
perfection. Yeah, that's the thing with this shit. It's like, uh, someone asked me, why are you focusing on gender identity ideology? And the thing is, as like, I think they even said over focusing on it. And it's, I th- have lost so much faith in the left and also just faith in my understanding of where things were going uh, that I don't feel a whole lot of, um, you know, like I know what to do or what to advocate or tell people what to think. The one thing I know is gender identity ideology is bullshit. Yeah, it's just like having John Edwards's, a whole bunch of John Edwards's running around and, but they're not being dismissed or laughed at. They're being kind of championed and focused on as some kind of revolutionary subject. Oh, come on, Mark. The other stuff, no, but the skulls? How could you possibly make one of these except by some kind of magic? In a factory? From glass? Oh, sure, come on. Could you make that? No. Could anyone? Yes. It's fucking absurd, but it's also the logical outgrowth of postmodernism and queer theory and all that bullshit. Sorry, science. Sorry, enlightenment. Sorry, logic. Which is itself an outgrowth of neoliberalism. So there's this kind of bind I find myself in where it's like, I know me making these arguments isn't going to change anything because we didn't get argued into this situation. Material conditions would have demanded the production of a John Money because of the pressures. It, It didn't have to be him. It doesn't have to be Vosh. It didn't have to be Judith Butler. And so, yeah, when I look at the world, I see the exact same economic pressures that created gender identity are even more pronounced now than they were when this was first fermenting. So while I would love this to end up being similar to lobotomies, where it was, you know, this um, craze that took America by storm, monorail... Cut your awkward cousin's frontal lobe out. (laughs) Desex your homosexual son. But cut, but there was no, um, there was no larger market to cutting people's frontal lobe out. So it was able to be corrected by regulation and the system itself. Whereas the types of colonization that transgenderism has allowed the medical industry to make in terms of the idea of, you know, plastic surgery being something that can stop you from killing yourself kind of thing, like, and that it's, like, uh, preferable to your natural body. They're just a couple of the um, really deep ideological shifts that trans has um, created, which has, you know, and that's not even getting to the, you know, full-on body disassociation etc. The point is, this ideology now taps into so many new markets that there's no way that capital will be forced to take to take a step backwards. Like, if the working class can't even win the ability to piss anymore, like Amazon workers are pissing in bottles. So if they can't even win that basic dignity, how are they... Like, why would... Why would the medical industry be scared that there's going to be any comeuppance for them if they start dabbling in a little modern eugenics? So the frustrating thing is it seems like it doesn't matter how coherent the arguments are, this thing isn't going to go away. And it'll probably get even more insane because we're currently living in very comfortable times. Like the inconvenience of COVID and COVID lockdowns would be infinitesimal to the inconvenience of like having your city bombed or something like that. And the earth's heating up. It looks like there's going to be something like a trillion refugees uh, at a certain point. And so I think things could get really, really nasty really quickly. And it's, you know, the material conditions determine the ideology. And when the material conditions get really bleak, the ideology will get just as bleak. Oh, clap, 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 clap.